uh, first, as everybody has said so far, growth in Africa, and by the way, when I say Africa, I mean sub-Saharan Africa, um, has been accelerating before the global economic crisis. It had gone from 2 to 3% a year to 5% and accelerating to over 6% in the three years prior to the crisis. And the other interesting fact is that this growth, unlike previous episodes, was quite widespread. Uh, there were 22 non-oil exporters that had better than 4% a year growth for a decade, from 1998 to 2008. Um, and there were various reasons for this that have already been mentioned. There was a uh, debt relief and aid an increase in remittances that hasn't been mentioned, but remittances that hit, reached $20 billion a year, um, and private capital flows, as uh, many people have mentioned, which at that point uh, was about, just before the crisis, was about $49 billion uh, a year. But I think the most fundamental reason was that economic policies, particularly macroeconomic policies in the continent, had improved. Uh, just one indicator is median inflation in Africa in the mid-2000s was half of what it was in the mid-1990s. Or to look at it another way, when you know, we had 13 countries in, two, in 1996 with higher than 20% inflation, which is kind of the, the danger zone. And by 2007, we're down to, down to two. And the... Now, when the, uh, and the, this, these improved macroeconomic policies and the growth that it was generating was creating a virtuous cycle where these reforms del uh, generated growth which generated political support for further reforms and things would continue to improve. Then when the crisis hit, several people, myself included, <laughs> uh, panicked. And this is one of the problems of having a blog is all your mistakes are out there on the Internet for everybody to see. But, but the reason I panicked was that this virtuous cycle had just been broken because all of a sudden economic reforms were no longer generating growth and uh, through no fault of the Africans. But that made it very hard to sustain the political momentum for further reforms. But the interesting thing was I was wrong. This didn't happen. In fact, most African policymakers continued with the prudent economic policies that had generated the growth in the past. They actually ran fairly modest fiscal deficits to cushion their countries uh, from, from the worst of the recessions. And some countries, like Ghana, actually contracted, because they had a large fiscal deficit to begin with, even though there was a worldwide recession. And as a result, actually, the economies rebounded. Uh, Africa turned around its growth in one year. Uh, because they were able to maintain prudent economic policy so that when the global economy revived, they were able to take advantage of it. And in fact, as, as Acha said, and I think Jeff may have mentioned, growth this year is up to about 5.1%, five, uh, 5 uh, and, and that's back to pre -crisis, the pre-crisis trend. And just, I, I like this chart because you take the, sort of the, the fastest growing countries in the world and except for the couple of the BRICs, uh, they're almost all in Africa. Um, uh, but that's the, this year. Uh, and the, as people have said, the, 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 as a result of these reforms, the business environment has improved. And just one indicator, which is the World Bank's doing business rankings, which is somewhat controversial, uh, does uh, rate several African countries ahead of, uh, ahead of, not only ahead of China, but in some cases ahead of Germany and and Malaysia uh, as, as well, and we've seen rapid progress. And then the same, I think you saw the same chart in Acha's presentation, except mine is just for sub-Saharan Africa, so the numbers are slightly different, but you see that private capital flows have now, uh, have, been, have rebounded again after the crisis and have actually surpassed uh, foreign aid to Africa uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in this, this year. Now, the big question for all of us and this was the question I think being posed at this conference, is, is this sustainable? Is this going to last or is it somewhere, uh, some um, uh, a, a passing uh, uh, phase that will that'll go, go away? Uh, and the reason why it's worth asking is because there are some really big constraints still. We haven't solved all the development problems in, in Africa. And I just want to focus on the two biggest constraints that you hear both from investors as well as from people in the African continent, 
I mean, investors from abroad and people from the African continent, which are infrastructure, which Jeff already mentioned, and skills, which has, I think, come up a few, few times uh, uh, already. And the infrastructure is absolutely clear. I mean, you can look at the, you can look at the numbers or you can look at the picture. <laughs> this is a photograph. This is not a map. This is a photograph of Africa and Europe at night. Um, and uh, you see the, the energy deficit uh, uh, right there. Uh, that uh, except for South Africa and a little bit of Nigeria, it's pretty much dark uh, at, uh, at, at night. Now, and, and we know the, the infrastructure problems are legendary. We've all been, <laughs> all experienced it. I experienced it two days ago in Tanzania. Uh, but I think what is worth keeping in mind is that much of these, these deficit is not necessarily due to a lack of infrastructure but rather of policies and regulations that stand in the way of infrastructure being made productive. And let me just illustrate with one example, which is to do with transport. Everyone says that Africa has a problem because uh, transport costs are very high. And if you've driven on some of those roads, it, it, it becomes very clear. Uh, and that makes it hard to compete in world markets because the cost, uh, transport costs stand in the way of being competitive. Now, we did a study of the four largest transport corridors, the road transport corridors in Africa. That they, these are the ones through which goods that are produced in, in the landlocked countries are shipped to the ports. And we looked at the vehicle operating costs along these four corridors. That's how, the, the costs of the trucks running through the, the corridors. And what we found, it was quite surprising that the pure vehicle operating costs along these four corridors are roughly the same as in France. But the, the transport prices, the amount they charge to put the goods on the ship in Africa are the highest in the world. Now, the difference between transport prices and vehicle operating costs is the profit margin that accrues to the trucking companies. And some of these profit, profit margins are actually quite high, I mean, they're off the order of 100%, uh, especially in, in Acha's neighborhood, the, the Central African ones uh, are over 100%, even though they may be the, the, the least, uh, least efficient. Now, how can this be? Well, it turns out that there are regulations in the books in almost all of these countries that prohibit entry into the trucking industry. And in the case of one country, the president's brother owns the trucking company, and so it's very hard to get any ref regulatory reform. Uh, one country, Rwanda, did uh, deregulate trucking, and transport prices fell 75% in, in real terms. So it isn't necessarily a problem of infrastructure, but it is a problem of getting the political support for reform of the, of the regulatory framework so we can uh, make some progress. And that's a, that's a hard problem, but it's not insoluble. Uh, and one example of what is, uh, to, to show that it is soluble is if you look at what has happened with information and communications technology, which you've all heard about uh, earlier as well. This is a case where I think Africa got the regulatory framework right. Uh, African countries by and large, with one or two exceptions, uh, uh, determined that what you needed was not government ownership of the, of the telecommunications industry, but a regulatory framework allowing private investment, and the place just took off. So it shows that once you can actually do it, uh, Africa can get the, inf the regulatory framework right, and today something like 90% of the urban population in Africa have access to a, uh, to a cell phone. And this has also meant that there's progress on things that need infrastructure. And I think the best example is uh, mobile banking, uh, the M-Pesa in, in Kenya, which is another phenomenal success story where you send money through your, your cell phones. I, in fact, have one of my own, uh, which I use to pay taxi drivers in Nairobi uh, and, and so on. Uh, and it has made a huge difference to the way for people to send money to their families in rural areas. And you can see that the progress has been uh, spectacular just in the last three years, and it's something like nine million households now have uh, M-Pesa uh, uh, accounts. But I think, th th so the, the infrastructure, there's a potential, but I think the skills problem, which several people have mentioned already, is an even deeper problem. Um, 
you know, we talk about the, the, the young people entering the labor force every year. 50% of them have just finished primary school uh, and uh, have only finished primary school. Uh, what is even more distressing, even though, as Jeff said, many people were going to school, what is more distressing is that they don't seem to be learning very much when they're in school. We just did a survey, uh, at least an NGO did a survey in Tanzania that found that of the seventh grade students, so these are students who have finished primary school, 20% of them couldn't read Kiswahili at the second grade level. And 30% of them couldn't do a second grade multiplication uh, problem. Uh, and half of them couldn't read English. And that's distressing because English is the medium of instruction in secondary schools. Um, so this means that half of them are just not going to be able to enter secondary schools. Now, what's going on here? Keep in mind, these children are in school. 80, 90% of the time, uh, 80, 90% of them are enrolled in primary school. Well, one problem is about a quarter of the time, the teacher is not there. Right? Teacher absentee rates in public primary schools, say in Uganda, is about 27%. In Tanzania, it's about 23%. Worse than that, when the teacher is in school, what we're finding is that the teacher is in class teaching only 18% of the time. And there's several, <laughs> certain part, a lot of the time we have no idea what the teacher is, even though they're registered as being uh, in, in the, the, these are the ones who are present. So there's a deep failure here of accountability. The teachers are, are paid whether or not they show up to work, they often don't want to live in rural areas, so they're, sit, they're in the urban areas and uh, get other jobs. Uh, they're, it, this behavior is sanctioned because they're often the political operatives in the local areas so that the, uh, the politi local politician guarantees them a job for which they don't have to show up for. And the victims are the poor, particularly the children, who have uh, uh, no, no teacher and therefore uh, no education. Um, the other side is also, the other side of skills though, and this is an important point, Jeff alluded to it earlier, is health. I mean, if the workers are not healthy, they're also not able to, 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 to work. And here there's another problem, which is there's a lot of money that goes into health, uh, including from the World Bank, I might add. Right? But then we've looked at how much of that money actually arrives at the public primary clinics which is what delivers the health services to the, to the poor. And the leakage rate is enormous. And to just to give you the extreme example, in Chad, the amount of money that leaks in the health sector before it reaches the public primary school is 99%. Right? It's one, only 1% 1 actually arrives in the, in the public primary school. Again, this is not an accident. Uh, this is not really a lack of capacity. There is a huge problem of accountability. Nobody is monitoring these people as the money cascades through, and you find that drugs are sold in the open market and, and uh, clinics are empty. Now, these are problems that we can't fix with uh, traditional solutions, shall we say, with uh, investment uh, projects or uh, development projects. They really have to change the fundamental incentives in the system. But there, too, I, I see progress. And this is why I am encouraged by the, uh, why I think that growth is sustainable. And let me give you just two examples. Uh, the first is in, in uh, th th this problem of absenteeism is also there in the health sector. Uh, absentee doctors. I think the rate is about 40% in some of these countries. But in Rwanda, they introduced a system where doctors were paid a bonus based on the number of children they immunized the number of uh, pregnant mothers that they examined. And the bonus was very small. It was about 50 cents per child immunized. And this was verified by an independent NGO. And the result was a remarkable increase in the, in the improvement in the health indicators in Rwanda. In just four years, the child mortality rate fell by 33%. Um, now, Lots of other things were going on in Rwanda at this time, but the interesting thing about this case is that they actually introduced the scheme, this, what's called the results-based financing scheme, on a randomized basis. So they were able to compare the control group with the treatment group, and you find that there was a statistically significant difference between what the, the health indicators in the treatment group and, and, the, and the control group. So there's some reason to think uh, 
that this was due to our uh, due to the results-based financing scheme.